Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle and today we have with us Bruce Hartman who is with Gideon Partners and we're looking forward to a conversation today with you, Bruce. Uh, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Mike. I'm pleased to be here. Good. Well, let's uh, get started with tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what led you to uh, uh, the industry and the ministry that you are currently in. Well, Mike, I was uh, CFO for a couple of Fortune 500 companies in the mid-2000s and started to get a feeling that uh, perhaps uh, I should be redirecting my life. Kind of ignored it for about four or five years, and then while I was at Yankee Candle as the CAO uh, and CFO of Yankee Candle, I decided to re- retire or resign uh, and enter uh, the Drew Theological School because I felt like to be in ministry, I needed to know more about who was Jesus, wh- what, are, what are the discipleship requirements, and just to, generally to know more about the theology of God and, and Christ. And uh, it was a wonderful experience, uh, a great education, and I think it, it set me up for what I'm doing today. Hmm. So it's more being driven that way by the compelling force of God and uh, with, with the influence of Jesus. So well, it's been an interesting journey. It's the best way to describe that. Yeah, I can imagine. And I would suspect that the time you were going through the decision process of moving from Yankee Candle into this next chapter, I'm sure that was not like a weekend um, thought process. No, it was, uh, Mike, it was, it, it, I'm glad you brought that up. It, it was a, it was a years long, uh, you know, thought process because you have these feelings that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then the, so once you have those feelings, you start to say, well, what is this all about? One of the things I noticed, Mike, is when I was golfing or, uh, you know, with my family or things like that, I started to thank God more for the experiences I was having. But at the same time, uh, I felt troubled in the workplace or the marketplace. Mm. So, uh, you know, through talking discussions with pastors and fortunately my brother-in-law is a uh, Baptist minister, so he was able to help me sort through some of this stuff. And it was a very difficult Monday evening, uh, May 5th uh, uh, is the exact date, 2009, that I decided that this just wasn't the life for me. And uh, fortunately, I was in a position where I could just, you know, stop working um, and go to the theological school here in uh, New Jersey. Yeah, you know, um, it's really interesting. I work um, in the kingdom business uh, world as well, working with some networking groups. And recently I went to a conference and there was a, um uh, author there, his name is Ken Allred, and he wrote a book called The Integrated Life. And it really, I read the book, bought it, and listened to his, his talk. And it was just really interesting because um, the, the way he prefaced it was, we just think that we go to church on Sunday, and then on Monday through Friday, we put our work hat on. And not that we're unethical or, or non-biblical in our dealings, but it's just like, here's work, here's church, here's work, here's church. But if we're, we think about it, we're called to live an integrated life. Life, which is, you know, what is it about our life that could condemn us to be, you know, part of the kingdom entrepreneurial uh, movement? You know, what would someone be able to go, ha ha, I knew it, you are a Christian. Well, sometimes it's hard to find in, in a, biz- a, Chris- a business who the owner is a Christian. So having that integration of just here we are and we're doing all to the glory of the Lord and how can we do that in our business dealings today? How can we do it in our social activity we go to tonight and, of course, um, in our ministry and our church on the weekends. Um, I'm sure you have a lot to say on the integrated, you know, ness of that, but what are some initial thoughts that way? You know, that's a, that's a really good point, uh, Mike, that, and that, that's a book I, I probably need to pick up and read. But, you know, when I wake up in the morning, which is usually around 4 o'clock, believe it or not, my wife thinks that nobody should be up at 4 <laughs> 
but it's a really good time to just kind of reflect and set up your day. And my day may be talking or counseling uh, somebody that works on Wall Street. Uh, it may be um, uh, right now I'm the president and chairman of a nonprofit uh, in New Jersey where we repair homes that were affected by natural disasters, for instance, Superstorm Sandy. So I may be on a conference call with them for a couple of hours. I'm also on a board for uh, uh, where it's called Urban urban squash. So what we do is we do fundraising to allow uh, urban youth to practice squash and get academic um, tutoring every afternoon. 86% of these kids, by the way, Mike, graduate from a four-year college and some of the best colleges in the country, uh, which is way above the national average. So I may spend time with that. Uh, I always spend time every day, maybe two to three hours every day on my business, Gideon Partners. And each of these conversations moves in and out of the marketplace all day long. And what uh, what I have to do in every conversation, what I learned that I had to do in every conversation is remember two things. What was God's will? Mm -hmm. And where is my heart in this conversation? So in other words, uh, what is it that God wants? And where is my heart? Is my heart with Jesus or is my heart with myself? And, you know, that's been probably the one thing I have to think about consistently every day. Um, and I think for, particularly for those of us from the marketplace, those are, I think, the two biggest issues you have to adjust to when you start doing work for Jesus. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it, what you were mentioning there made me think of um, something else. Have you ever heard of the uh, book called Blueprint for Life by Mike Kendrick? Yes, I have. Yeah, I, I just love that. In fact, uh, right now um, I teach the college and career Sunday school class at our church, a little Baptist church here and just outside of Denver, and we're going through that um, curriculum. It's a wonderful, like about an eight-week curriculum um, blueprint for life. Well, it's interesting how so it's just is starting out in the beginning of that talking about everyone feels that draw to uh, what is my purpose. You know, you think of the book, um, Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life, you know, national, huge bestseller, and that was transcending over past just church lines. So people want to know their purpose. Well, Blueprint for Life is, is setting the stage for saying, first and foremost, figure out and find out what God is up to in the world. And that's an easy answer, you know, drawing people to himself and, and unto salvation. And then the second step is, now get involved in what God is up to in the world. So if we're doing that in our life and our business, now does that mean we have to have the large print thick family Bible on our desk at work or on the counter at the, the job? You know, probably not because now, you know, that, that could be abrasive to some people. But I literally just um, – this morning had a uh, interview reschedule and, sit, and the person said, "Hey, just had a family emergency with my daughter." So I emailed back and said, "Hey, praying for you. I um, just had the same thing happen with my daughter a few weeks ago. You know, hope everything turns out." Little snippets like that are just in conversation. We don't have to quote chapter and a verse on nineteen uh, uh, different passages for to make an impact. So it's just those little things. So I think, yeah, that's a, a wonderful point that you brought up. And then when you think about the the to do items under figure out what God's up to in the world and then get involved in that, that can take on a variety of things for different people. What's good for you, works for you, might be different than someone else. Yeah, and, that's, and, that, and that to me is uh, one of the important parts of my ministry, particularly if I'm counseling people that are looking, Christians that are looking for a job, is I always ask them like, to create a seven word vision statement for their life, not where they want to go work, but what is it that God wants you to do? And you have to put it in seven words. Mm. And I use, I use seven in a lot of my uh, coaching and uh, whether it's for business or uh, with, with folks uh, because of the importance of the number seven in the Bible. Yeah. And I think that's a way of honoring God by having a seven word vision, but also practically if you can write your vision of what God wants you to do in seven words, it's very focused. And that's typically what I find with God. It's a very focused and clear, simple message. Well, and, and guess what else that does? It gets you thinking. Years ago when Twitter first came out, I wrote a blog post called How to Twitterize Your Marketing. 
meaning. <laughs> you read That's you read all kinds of things that are so verbose that could have been said in two paragraphs, and here it is 28 pages later. So how can you condense your messages, marketing messages? Well, what you're saying is, wow, seven words? You, you could... Sp- you could uh, spend hours and hours figuring out those seven words, and what does that mean? That means that you really molded over and crafted it and prayed about it, and, oh, man, I'm, I'm at 14 words. Shoot, how can I get it down to seven? Oh, I'm at 10, 9, 8, and now all of a sudden you've got it, and you're like, yeah, that really resonates with me. Yeah, and the other thing, that it's, it's kind of like exercise, because you're right. You just don't sit down, and in 10 minutes you come up with the seven words. It may take months. Mm-hmm. Uh, it certainly takes prayer, and it certainly takes interaction with the world, uh, where you will hear other Christians or perhaps something that you read in the Bible or something that you remember. And typically, I won't, uh, I won't agree that it's God's direction until I've at least had three confirmations. So, mm-hmm. in other words, I've coincidentally read it in the Bible or somebody else has mentioned to it to mention something to me that's related to what I've been praying about. And I find that that's the most effective way. I don't think any of us can ever know exactly what God uh, mm-hmm. wants in our life. We only can know directionally. Um, so th- that's been a big help. And the, the second thing I do is on that theme of seven, I also ask people to write down, what are the seven tactics that you think God wants you to take? to achieve this life vision for yourself. And again, that also really works, makes the people work harder uh, because they got to come up with seven. So, Well, and, and to bank off of what you just said there, it's kind of like, you know, ooh, that's a good point. Made me think of this. Well, um, I've said for years, and, I, and I've stolen this from somebody who knows where, but somebody has said this, but I love it. Um, the phrase knowledge is power is untrue. Knowledge right. is potential power. You have to put it into action for that knowledge to be truly powerful. Well, if you have, you know, God's will in seven words, now what? What does that mean? Tactics. And part of my tagline for my company is strategy, tactics, and execution. Meaning you have to have a strategy, then you got to know what tactics you're going to use to implement the strategy, but even if you know the tactics, then you got to execute them. So yeah, I just love those the, the synergy between those two uh, directions you mentioned, because knowing God's will for your life, that's a little tough, but now what tactics can you use to kind of get each and every day closer and closer? Because sometimes, you know, we hear that phrase, walk of faith, sometimes it is, and, and one step down the road, and then the ne- never the step down the road, maybe it's 8, 10, 15 steps down the road that God starts going, okay, now see, look at this, look at where this opened up. And remember those two uh, trips and falls back there you had? That's because I wanted you to see this and meet this person. And now all of a sudden, wow, here we are. And you might never have gotten there unless it was for that first step. Yeah, Mike, that's really well said. Uh, And as you were talking, I was I was uh, reliving experiences, uh, and many of them fell just exactly the way you said. And Mm. uh, it's to me, uh, I don't know if this was for you, but for me, this was part of the journey um, that you had to do the stumbles that you mentioned, but you also had to have a plan so you could see that you stumbled. And you had to have, you know, these daily conversations, which I do at four in the morning or five Mm -hmm. in the morning with God to know, okay, well, I messed up here and, you know, I did better here and things like that. But as you said, you have to have a plan. Well, it reminds me too of, of Joseph in the Bible, you know, think of from the juxtaposition of Joseph in the pit to Joseph, the ruler, when his whole family comes down to get the food. Wow. That was quite the transformation, but boy, those steps in between were pretty tough for him. And he's thrown his hands up going, why God, I'm fleeing from this woman. I'm now in jail. I, and now all of a sudden you look back and go, huh, maybe that was so I could get a step closer here and a little sideways closer here. And then now look at the position that he was in to save not just his family, but so many people with the wisdom that he had with the seven years of famine, the seven years of abundance. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, a story I see 
but particularly as I've entered this journey, to me, it's a, a, what you're describing is learning how to uh, live your life with God. And, um, you know, that's, it's, it's a learning process, uh, much like my brother is a deer hunter and I can go out in the woods with him and have no idea where the deer are, but he will, he will, he will know exactly where they are and where to go. And that, that's part of living with God is learning to see, um, God in our lives, uh, through providence and coincidences, not coincidences anymore. Mm -hmm. And Life is always a learning process, and it's a journey every day, which is an exciting journey. I look forward to waking up every morning. And, and speaking of books and examples, have you read the book, um, kind of an old one by now, by uh, Bruce Wilkinson called The uh, Prayer of Jabez? Yes, I have. So he, what you described there reminded me of Jabez moments, and I think that we can miss Jabez moments, which are opportunities to at least, to maybe minister to someone, encourage someone, pray for someone, or give them a, a you know some edification, or maybe it's just an, an aha moment that we have of wow, Lord, you just really met my need here. Um, but guess what? I think that we in the society we're in today miss so many of these opportunities and moments for one big reason: we are booked and we are frenzied and fast and furious and we've got our text and our instant message and our social media and our schedule and our this and our that and I think that we just are zip 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 going God catch up and boy that's just a a bad spot to be in so maybe you're four or five in the morning quiet before the world gets uh, stirring and rustling around man you could you someone take some of those moments and just kind of be that human being, not the human doing that we all tend to be. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I started doing that centering in the morning, because if I did, my, my day would be out of control, as you just described, by 10 o'clock. And it's also developing this sense of confidence. Uh, it's much like diving into a dark pool. That, to me, that's kind of what faith is. But you know that God is in charge, and you're going to be okay. So where I used to be anxious if I was running five minutes late or ten minutes late, now I marvel at how God worked out that, that day for me, And if, particularly if I notice and pay attention. And I'm not saying that every incident of that is God-related. Sometimes it's me just asserting myself where I shouldn't mm-hmm. But it is amazing how many things work themselves out once I'm aware of where I am and what I'm doing. Well, and you know, here's another thought, which is um, we can get so fast and furious that we miss out on things. But even if that, you know, by per chance that we do catch a couple of those moments and we recognize, oh, that was a God moment, great, and then right back to our life. How do how can we mark those moments in time for? reflection in the future. So think about the Old Testament. It's just a, a, a big old uh, collection of God moments of God taking care of the children of Israel, right? If you want to look at it in that, that respect, it's, it's just a, a chronology of God's love and God's taking care of the children of Israel, and oops, they messed up, then he was faithful. Well, how can we replicate that in our life? I use um, a gratitude journal. So not every single time, but boy, I've got almost filled up right now. I need to get a new one of the date and going, Lord, this happened today. Thank you so much. Boy, this was really neat. Little teeny little things and big things. Because if we then have that down day, which they all come, could we pull out our gratitude journal and go, ooh, that was a time that, that wow, yeah, I remember that. Ooh, I, would, I never would have remembered the time that we, whatever. So I think that we have to find ways for ourselves to, to implement that in our life because then it becomes encouragement uh, in the future for us. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea, Mike. I think I'm going to start a gratitude journal now yeah, as well. Yeah, steal it. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, well, now we'll borrow it from God. Uh, yep, swipe and adapt. <laughs> right. Well, you but know what it does, too, though? If you are watching for ways to fill your gratitude journal, what are you not watching for? Right. Right? right. And, and if, we're watch, if we're like, oh, what a horrible day today's going to be, well, you're going to find something. See, I knew that person would pull out in front of me. 
it, and it really is our mindset. So if we're watching for ways to be grateful, you know, I've, I've read, uh, oh, I think it's the, I forget what, what, what um, either five-minute journal or some book that I've read recently where they said every single day write down, um, keep this list, whether it's in an Evernote or a computer file or a handwritten whatever, but three good things. At the end of every day, write down what were three good things that happened today. And sometimes you need to really pick your brain and go, oh, man, um, well – and, and and if we're watching for those three good things, you know, hey, you know, God really provided this and really allowed this, then all of a sudden, now at the end of every day, a before you go to sleep, which is wonderful for you know preparing yourself for sleep, but just every day we're marking in time. I'm watching for the good, watching for God's hand in our life. I think that's super super important. Yeah, and I, I at this point, I in my life, I wouldn't even know how to exist without watching for God. Mm-hmm. Um, and having his direction in life. And one of the things that I do, Mike, um, in my counseling, particularly for those that are looking for a job, uh, is I give them exercises every week. I try to build them up to, you know, how do you present yourself in the most positive light to an employer? But obviously, you have to you have to be that person the employer wants to hire. But mm-hmm. more importantly, you have to be that person God wants you to be. So I give them this exercise that for 48 hours, every single person they meet, they have to make them smile. Mm. I love and, it. and you know how hard that is. You know, we live here in New Jersey, which has got some of the craziest drivers in the world. So you think about that when you get cut off or, you know, maybe you go to Starbucks and the person waiting on you is having a bad day. You know, it can be a very difficult thing. But the reason why I have people do that is not so much just for them to learn how important it is to be nice, but I think it's one of the things that helps change people's hearts in terms of knowing why you have to be nice and why you have to be important and why you should recognize the good things in life. Because I think people do get beaten down in life and start to become negative and by doing this, it helps them because when you go to, when, when somebody goes to an employer, they don't want somebody that's um, negative or passive or, you know, just kind of sitting there. They want somebody that's upbeat, that wants to work with the team is going to be a positive influence. So, and I also believe that that's what God wants us to be. Yeah, you, you 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 know, to be a friend, you need to be friendly. To get a job, you need to be the person that that person needs on the job. You know, all of those uh, uh, kinds of things. It just really, really is uh, super, super powerful. Um, so, tell me about your upcoming projects. I understand you have a book you are working on. Yeah, I, one of the things that uh, that I notice uh, is you know from being from being in the marketplace and at a senior level. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues, Mike, that come up every day from a morality standpoint, from an ethics standpoint, and for from what's your priority. So the book is written, It's the book is going to be called Jesus in the Marketplace, and we're uh, pretty far along with the writing of it. We have a good system for writing it, and I'm using a ghostwriter. Uh, to help with the flow. And the, t- the two subjects we center on is Jesus in the garden um, of Gethsemane, your, your will, not mine. Mm. And for business people, we, we face that every day. When you're talking to your customer, are you doing a sleight of hand? Are you really being genuine? Have you really, uh, do you really understand what their problem is? And, or are you more interested in your commission? Um, or you're talking with an employee. Do you re, are you really telling them everything? And if you're not, because it gives you some advantage. So those are things where you have to do God's will versus your own. So we talk about, we talk about that a lot in the book and we juxtapose between the stories of Jesus and also the stories of, um, you know, within my life of people that I knew that were positive examples. And the second thing we talk about is, you know, where is your heart? Is your heart to make money? 
or is your heart to live the life God wants you to live? And that happens every day. Uh, you know, particularly as a dad, you always have to think about what's the right thing for your family. And Gail says, says this best. I am third. I don't know if you've ever read. Them. I remember that from way back in the day, Chicago bear. <laughs> yeah. And it was actually an eighth grade book that for me now has become an important theological thought. Uh, yeah. Right. So God, family, and then you were third. And this was something that Gail says had been talked by a coach. But one of the, so one of the things that we try to do in the book is to reinforce that it's not that Jesus and God and Holy Spirit don't want you to be rich. That's not what the point is. The point is that what are your priorities? Where is your heart? And that's really more the issue. So if you're making money, like Volkswagen is, is really a good example. We've actually mm-hmm. cited that in the book. What were what were the employees thinking when they covered up emissions yep. that would potentially pollute our economy? What if one person at that company had gone to somebody and said, uh, you know, this is happening? Uh, and it, there's also good examples of this. In 2002, the time people of the year were the three whistleblowers. I don't know if you remember Enron, WorldCom, and uh, the Southern... There was a, one other company, which I don't I forget the name of it, but those three women were made uh, people of the year. So while it was great personal risk for them, they did the right thing. They did what Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit would want them to do. The third thing that, so those are the two kind of themes of it, but it, it straddles between the world of theology and the world of the marketplace. And one of the arguments we make in the book is that many people think that Jesus came from a from the temple, from the uh, the religious sect of the Judean uh, world. In fact, all twelve of his disciples, the original twelve disciples, none of them were trained clergy. Mm-hmm. And if you look in his book, 122 of his 140 parables are about everyday life and yep. in the marketplace. Yeah, he went for and, fishermen. He went for tax collectors and not the rabbis and, and, and the clergy. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good... And who and who did he argue with? He argued with the... Uh, the establishment. Mikey, yeah, the religious establishment. So, yeah. And we're also trying to add some historical context. Like, a lot of people believe that when the, that the tables that were overturned were turned in the temple... Well, they were actually turned over in the court of the Gentiles, which in the Judean period, a lot of the markets uh, were next to the temple because it was also a place of commerce. Right. So, so having people not think of Jesus as this cute little song, but the real importance of following Jesus and the cost of discipleship isn't really as high as you think it is. In the short term, it always is. But in the long term, it never is. So that's the that's kind of the book that we're trying to do. We're trying to mainstream the book, Mike, uh, as opposed to you know going to the religious publish housing publishing houses. Mm-hmm. We're trying to use the more traditional publishing house, and the reason is is we believe that the book is for the masses and not for um, just professors of theology and. Mm-hmm. Um, people like that. So, and we're trying to write Love the it. book so that the masses can, can understand it. Well, we could talk of, for, of course, hours and hours on end, I'm, I'm confident of, but at this point, what is the best way that someone could learn more about you, your ministry, your business, and the upcoming book? Uh, we're setting up, actually starting next week, we're working on constructing the website. You know, one of the things, Mike, uh, my business just took off. I've been incredibly busy. Uh, and so I finally have said, you need to get, uh, you need to get, uh, a website going so people know how to get, get in, get into contact with you. But if obviously they can uh, look me up on LinkedIn or, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate, Mike, but I could give you my email and they could write to me. Yeah. Whatever works for you. So, um, yeah, Bruce Hartman on LinkedIn. And then what's a good email address to use for you? Uh, B Hartman, one, two, three, four, five at gmail.com. 
Awesome. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful getting to know you today. All right. Same here, Mike. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, God bless. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.